For millennia, humans have been obsessed with space. Our earliest ancestors, with only their eyes, peered into the heavens in order to navigate the world, keep track of time, and even plan their crops. In 1543, Nicholas Copernicus revolutionized astronomy when he proposed a heliocentric model of the solar system. Not long after, the invention of telescopes allowed us to look further and more clearly than ever before at our celestial neighbors. Our knowledge of the universe was growing. In 1969, humankind took another giant leap forward when, for the first time, we stepped foot on a heavenly body not our own, the moon. Apollo 11 was a watershed moment in human history, as we broke through barriers once thought impossible. Meanwhile, new technologies like the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescopes are helping us observe the very beginnings of time itself. But perhaps nowhere has captured our collective astronomical imaginations quite like the red planet itself, Mars. From its first observation by the ancient Egyptians to the engineering marvels of today's rover expeditions, Mars has enthralled astronomers and laypersons alike. And if you've ever seen just about any piece of pop culture about Mars, you've likely noticed that our collective fascination with it centers around one thing, life. Is there, or has there ever been, life on Mars? As it exists today, no. Mars simply doesn't have the environmental conditions to support complex life. So no little green men if that's where you thought this video was going. But microbial life, either living today or long gone, is a much more distinct possibility. See, more than 3 billion years ago, Earth and Mars actually had similar climates. And it's actually around this time in Earth's history that we see some of the first evidence of life. So could Mars have hosted life back then too? Maybe. And national parks might hold the key to helping us unlock this mystery. So today, I want to tell you about three ways national parks are helping us find life on Mars. Everywhere we find water on Earth, we find life. So it was only natural that the search for life on Mars began with the search for water. If conditions existed that allowed water to flow over the Martian surface, there is a chance that conditions existed that gave rise to microbial life. And so the search for water began in one of the driest places in the world, Death Valley, California. If you look closely at Death Valley, especially in Badwater Basin, you'll see a subtle sign that this place isn't as devoid of water as it might seem. In fact, you'll find the telltale signs of flowing water in the form of alluvial fans. If you scan Death Valley from above, you can see these alluvial fans flowing out from the Panamint and Amargosa Mountains. The alluvial and these alluvial fans comes from the term alluvium, which refers specifically to sediment deposited by rivers. This is key. Remember, we're looking for water on Mars. In Death Valley, these fans are created as water runs down through the mountains, hits the broad, flat surface of Badwater Basin, and fans outward, depositing large sediments first and smaller ones out toward the edge. The result is a nice fan shape. You can think of it like a river delta without the river, but either way, alluvial fans are telltale signs of water. So when Mars researchers found large fan-shaped piles of sediment at the bottom of impact craters, you can imagine their excitement. These fans were incredibly similar to the ones found in Death Valley, an indication that water might once have flowed down the steep sides of Martian craters. Now, these Martian fans are billions of years old, Water hasn't flowed over them in a long time, but it has flowed nonetheless. And again, water means life. The fact that water once flowed over the surface of Mars meant the search for life there could begin in earnest, and Death Valley had helped lead the way. Now that scientists were pretty sure water had once flowed on Mars, they turned their attention to finding actual signs of life not just the conditions that could lead to it. The park that led the way in this instance was Capitol Reef. Famous for its water pocket fold, a hundred mile long rift in the Earth's surface, it was actually a geologic feature thousands of times smaller that provided the next clues of life on Mars. A geologic feature called a blueberry. The technical term for these blueberries are actually concretions. They are made of an iron-rich mineral called hematite, 
and are formed when iron in rocks is carried away by groundwater and finds its way into cracks and pores in said rock. Once there, when that iron comes into contact with oxygenated water, it basically starts to rust, precipitating itself out of the water and leaving the hematite deposited in these cracks and pores. Eventually, the softer rock erodes away and the small, blueberry-sized concretions are scattered across the desert floor. Now, here on Earth, some of these concretions are associated with microbes, and there are indications that these microbes expedite the formation of hematite here on Earth. So if we found something like blueberries on Mars, there's a possibility microbial life helped form them there too. And uh, spoilers, we found the blueberries on Mars, or at least some version of them. Satellite imagery confirmed large concentrations of hematite in a region of Mars known as Meridiani Planum, which was then chosen as the landing site for the Opportunity rover. Once on the ground, Opportunity identified small, rounded rocks, which were later identified as hematite concretions, just like the ones found in Capitol Reef. If we can find some link between the Martian concretions and microbial life, that brings us one step closer to finding evidence of life on Mars. And for the latest research into extraterrestrial life, we're staying in southern Utah and heading to Canyonlands National Park. But really, you can visit just about any place in the southwestern United States to find the subject of this latest research. Rock varnish. Much like the varnish you'd put on a piece of wood furniture, Rock varnish is actually a thin coating or film on top of the rock. It is not part of the rock itself. It hasn't been weathered or eroded in any way. It appears as a dark stain on the rock, one you likely recognize if you've seen pictures of southwestern landscapes. The indigenous petroglyphs these landscapes are famous for are actually carved into the varnish, not drawn on. Rock varnish takes thousands of years to form, perhaps growing only the width of a strand of hair in a single millennia and the origins of rock varnish are still not fully understood, which has huge implications for life on Mars because it means a biological origin can't be ruled out. Right now, what we do know is that rock varnish is composed primarily of iron and manganese oxides. The leading hypothesis states that bacteria are responsible for oxidizing that iron and manganese, giving it that rusty color, and then they quote unquote cement it to the rock surface. These bacteria are highly adapted to extreme conditions, not unlike those seen on Mars. Which is good news, because rock varnish has been found on Mars. If the link between bacteria and rock varnish here on Earth proves to be true, it bodes well in the search for Martian microbes as well. So what you get when you take these three examples isn't a complete picture of the search for life on Mars. We simply don't have time for that and I'm certainly not qualified to cover it on this channel. But what you do get is a glimpse at the role national parks are playing in that search. These are three of the most crucial pieces of evidence that life once existed on Mars, and national parks had played a key role in each of their discoveries. Death Valley's alluvial fans helped prove that water once flowed over the red planet, setting off the search for life in the first place. Capitol Reef's blueberries, associated with microbial life, upped the ante as we found similar minerals on Mars. And the rock varnish of Canyonlands, its origins still a mystery, revealed that life finds a way even in the most inhospitable of conditions. Without the protection afforded to these landscapes, researchers might never have discovered these striking examples at all. The search for life on Mars might have been completely different, or it might not have happened at all. But it did, and it will continue, thanks to national parks. If you want to learn more about the world's protected places, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. It helps me bring more park stories like this one to more people. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.